Um, I'm going to go a little quickly tonight because there's a lot to cover and it's a setup. Actually, it's a connection between, we talked about identifications of love and now tonight it's hearts of stone and inner vows and then next week it'll be healing victims of sexual abuse and they're really connected. In fact, a lot of the subjects that we've talked about over the first two semesters are connected. Um, if you just put the slide up about the books, um, if some of you, if something resonates tonight and you'd like to read up a little bit more on it, the book is called Growing Pains. That's the one on the top there. That's one of the four books that the Sanfords uh, wrote. And these two topics, Hearts of Stone and Inner Vows, are found in chapter six and seven of that book, Growing Pains. And then if you just look at this next one like a clock, uh, you probably won't see it that well, but I'll be sending you the slide. So it's good to think of things in, in a certain kind of order in the way we've been explaining it to you and understanding, like somebody said to me this week, I, I, I recognize that I'm on a journey with God and he'll keep showing me things that he wants me to work on. And I used to think that was a bad thing, but now I realize it's a really good thing because I want to keep getting closer to who he is. Instead of thinking I should be perfect, I'm a Christian, I've been doing this a long time, why am I still struggling with whatever, fill in the blank, you realize you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're very complex in your makeup. Things have impacted you that you don't even connect yet, but that's part of what Holy Spirit does in us is bring up some of the, I don't know, they call it dross in the Old Testament. When they would purify the silver, they would heat up the silver, it would become liquid, and it would start to boil, and all the impurities would come up to the surface, right? So it's not that we're, we're like looking for problems in our lives. We're just saying, whatever's slowing me down, wherever there's fuel in my engine that's not pure, I want it out because it's hard enough to live life. Uh, every obstacle that can be removed, we want it out, right? That's That should be our goal. And I started there uh, as if it was a clock, right? So you would start around 1230, uh, part one, sanctification and transformation. Okay, that's what we covered right at the beginning, that when you become a born-again Christian, you accept the Lord, but you're on milk, and you have to move off the milk onto what? You want to go on to the meat. You know, it's just like a baby is totally dependent when they first become when they're first born, but you don't want them staying totally dependent. You want them growing up and standing on their own two feet. So they're, they're going to be eating meat, and that's what that sanctification and transformation process is. You, you stop doing the things you were doing when you were unsaved. You realize now, uh, I have a different standard that I'm living by. The Word of God is my standard. I don't curse like I used to, and if I still do and I find myself slipping once in a while, God can heal that. He can get that out of my system. He doesn't want me doing that. He, he, he wants me to be careful about what I watch and what I look at and, and treat my body like a temple of the Holy Spirit. Well, that's a process. That doesn't just, it's not a switch that just goes off inside. Your mind has to be renewed. You study the word and you become a different person, right? You have a new nature. He said he allows us to partake of the divine nature. What a privilege that is. But don't beat yourself up if it's not happening fast enough, you know, quote unquote, because you'll go for periods where it doesn't feel like much is happening and then you'll get a boost. And it's just the way the Lord works. The more we could just stay surrendered before him and humble and say, Lord, you know, not my will today, but your will be done. Yeah. We've been meeting on Tuesday mornings, as you know, that's, you know, when we have this class at night and we have communion at, at the start of the day, right there together at the diner, right, you know, as a symbol that we want to dedicate our day to you, Lord. We recognize our flesh can be weak. Spirit's willing, but the flesh can be weak. So when you break that bread, you're, you're reminding yourself, hey, I need help today. I can't do this all on my own. I don't want to let my pride rise up and forget that I need God. All right, and then we did performance orientation, okay? And anybody have a quick definition for that? And I'm hoping that if we talk about this enough, you'll start to do some word association, right? So anybody want to just shout it out real quick, what, what you think of when you think of performance orientation? Earning love, that's a good one. Earning love. I'd like to just expand a little and say believing a lie that I will only be loved if I perform well, okay? And that's a really big part of our culture. So that's another thing that we're all subject to. No matter where you live in the world, there's going to be parts of the culture that are acceptable and normal in the culture that aren't lining up with the truth of the Word of God. So we all have to sort that out and we have to make our decisions on what's more important i'm just thinking when i was in mozambique as an example we were with heidi baker and we were in her orphanage 
And I was going in with the infants because that was part of my heart. You know, I lo I've always loved kids and loved being around babies and, and, and just praying over them and, and holding them and hugging them. And there were no men from Africa there. And I, I was only with the other women. And I didn't get it at first. I didn't realize it. But then they said to me, no, the men won't come in here because they're warriors and raising the, raising the babies is for the women. All right, now that's not a godly thing to do, right? But their culture is so strong that that's, that's something that's got to be overridden. And the more you get the word in you, the more you realize God's culture is the one that we have to follow, right? So in our culture, performance orientation is all over the place. We hope it's not in the church, but it can be in the church too. So we, even there, we want to be careful. You're not going to believe a lie that if you work harder in the church and you involve yourself in more ministries, that God will love you more. That's a lie. What can you do to get God to love you more? Thank you. Louder. Because he already loves you more than you'll ever even imagine, and you can't earn it. You don't earn it. And it's real easy for people in leadership positions to take advantage of your desire to want to please God and, and dangle that little extra blessing out. If you just work harder, he'll love you a little bit more. That's a lie. So don't believe the lie that I'll be loved more if I perform well. And if somebody's doing that to you, if they're dangling the blessing, but you just never seem to get there, that's unhealthy. That's not a good, healthy relationship. When we do marriage counts, we say it's not a 50-50 relationship. It's 100-100, okay? And you could argue that their 100 isn't so good. Well, okay, we all feel that way at some point in the marriage. What you want to know is that person is all in, and they're giving it everything they have, right? And they're trying with the best of their ability, and God will change them. And it's one of the greatest compliments somebody could pay you is, I've known you for 20 years, and you've really changed for the better since I've known you. I've watched you grow in your walk with the Lord, right? What a, what a wonderful thing. Accomplishing forgiveness is something we'll touch on tonight. It's very hard to avoid that subject as a Christian. You're always, you'll have to think about this. I, I just said today to somebody, you have to have a clean slate. If, if you think you forgave the person, but they still owe you something, you haven't fully accomplished forgiveness, right? There's a debt in the account that they still owe you. Well, that's not completely releasing it, and that's what accomplishing forgiveness means, is that you really want the best for them. They don't owe you anything, and you've let them go. If you see them, you're not going to be upset and, you know, pray that a car rides by and splashes them with that cold, icy, slushy stuff. <laughs> Get them, Lord. Oh, then you didn't really forgive them, okay? Yeah, so I won't even go down that path. How about bitter root judgments? What do you think of with that? Any, any word association pop into your brain? Bitter root judgments. It's from Hebrews chapter 12. And it says, beware lest any of you fall short of the, of the grace of God. And that, that bitter root judgment that you're holding in your heart will not only defile you, but will defile many. And a judgment is a sin. It's, it's, it's degrading other people and saying they're never going to change. They can't change. They're basically irredeemable. And aren't you glad God didn't say that about you? Amen. See, when you make a judgment about a spouse or a parent or somebody that's a primary relationship in your life, that's a sin, right? Especially if it's towards your parents because the Bible says honor your mother and father, not just when they're honorable, but honor them at all times. I see a mother and a son back there. You should be looking at him and saying, hey, pay attention right now. <laughs> Honor your mother and father. That life may go well with you. See, Paul calls it the first commandment with a promise. And then you could say, in any way that I don't honor my parents, life is not going to go well with me. That same rule applies. But they're not being honorable. That's not what he's asking you to do. He didn't say just honor them when they're honorable because you'll become a parent someday and you'll see how difficult it is. So it's really important to keep that relationship strong. It doesn't mean everything they do is okay, but it means that in as much as you can, you find the good in them and you believe the best, that they did the best they could when they raised you. Did they make mistakes? Of course. Are you making mistakes with your children? Of course, right? So same thing. Don't have a bitter root inside. It's a judgment. It's condemn the person and they have no redemption in your mind. That's a sin because you can't condemn what God hasn't condemned. And there's no person that's irredeemable to God, okay? And then parental inversion, that's when children are asked to do too much, take on too much responsibility at too young of an age. They're robbed of their childhood. 
many times they'll carry that forward into adulthood and look like very responsible people, but because they're so used to crisis management, they're not very comfortable just being relaxed and at ease. So even if there's not a problem, they'll try to create one because that's when they feel valued. It's very hard for them to relax, right? The fruit to root patterns is if I'm dealing with an issue, I use anger as an easy one to illustrate it. If I have a quick fuse, if I'm involved in road rage, you know, if there's an inappropriate amount of, of a response to something, there's a root. That the fruit of it is that I'm getting angry, but the root of it is something different than somebody just cut you off. There's a rage going on on the inside, and something's feeding that fire, right? So you could take that across a lot of different things, not just anger, but that's an easy one because we all have to deal with that one, and say, look, I don't want to treat the symptoms. I want to find the source of the problem. And prayer is a wonderful way. If you ask the Lord to say, where is this coming from? What happened in my life that's causing me not to trust people or a number of other things? And Easter and Cindy and our team here, we're counseling with people on a regular basis pretty much every day. There's people coming here for prayer ministry, and that effectively is what we're doing. We're tracking from the fruit in their life back down to the root because if you want to get rid of something and you just cut it off at the surface, you're not getting the plant's just going to grow back because the root wasn't dealt with, right? So unforgiveness could be one of those main ones. And like you said, you, I have forgiven the person. Okay, but if there's still fruit here, maybe you haven't fully accomplished that forgiveness. So there might still be more that you have to deal with. And they're very patient and very good and everything's confidential and there's no cost. So we really want you to avail yourself of that resource that's here. Then when we did part two, I went into this idea of what happens, part of the fruit of dealing with your stuff and, 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 and coming to grips with what the roots are and, and moving on, being healed of that thing and, and not having to deal with it anymore. It's like getting delivered from an addiction, right? You, the thing that was driving you so much, now it, the, there's no desire to want to do it anymore. It's just been totally defeated in your life and resurrection power came in and now you don't want to touch that thing, whatever that thing you were addicted to was, right? So what happens as a result of that is your relationships improve. And the devil destroys relationships. That's one of his main weapons is to drive a wedge between relationships. He can't create anything. We're made in God's image, and we can create life. So if he can destroy the ability to create by dividing marriages and dividing relationships and breaking up families and siblings and creating all kinds of bitterness among people, that's misery loves company. But you fight back and say, no. I choose, you know, there's so many great verses in the Bible about this. As much as it's within your power, pursue peace with all men. All right? You can't control what they do, but you can control how you respond to what they do. You could take the high road biblically and say, you know what? I know you're upset with me. I want you to forgive me. You're not letting me back into your heart, but I'm going to still keep trying because I want this relationship to work. You don't, you don't bail on people. And that could be part of what we're going to talk about tonight with a heart of stone is that you've been hurt so much that you've just sealed yourself off to protect yourself. But not only are you protecting yourself, nobody can get in. And it's, they compared it to like a rock being under a waterfall. You know, it's wet on the outside, but nothing's getting into that penetrated inside, right? So what God does is crack that open, but we have to, we have to participate in that process with him and say, you want me to trust again? I don't know. I've been burned so many times. If I trust again and, and I get hurt again, I'm going to be upset with you. <laughs> and straighten it out with him when you see him, when you get up there someday. But here's the deal. He's not saying you're not going to ever get burned again. He's saying it's not worth shutting down everything else because you don't want to deal with the problem that you face. People will let you down, but you, I'll give you the tools, God is saying, that you'll still be able to get through it. And don't bail on the whole process just because you don't want to get hurt. It's worth it to stay in relationship with people and take that risk. That's a big part of what we'll talk about tonight. Basic trust, that just talked about how if you have a crack in your foundation when you're growing up, it doesn't just go away with time. You could be an adult that's functioning well in a bunch of different areas, but you could have arrested development in this area that wasn't dealt with in that early stage of basic trust. And we find that often. And, and it seems very hard for the person to reconcile in their mind, like, how come my life is going so well in all these other areas, but in this one thing, I'm having a hard time in my relationships trusting people, let's just say. Well, that could be way back into the early days 
of when you were being raised, and some seed got planted in there, and you might have made an inner vow. That's the other topic tonight, right? Hearts of stone and inner vows. I'm, I'm never going to put myself in a vulnerable position again. That's a vow, right? And that contrary to the Word of God. So we have to renew our minds, right? The Word of God is what renews our minds. But we also have to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And that's not easy to do, is it? How many thoughts go through your brain every day? It takes a lot of work to capture every one of them. And it's like you're, you're the guy at the border with the gun, and they're trying to sneak in, and you're going, nope, I, I'm capturing you. You're not coming through. You don't have the papers to get in here. Wrong kingdom. I'm only allowing the truth to come into my brain, right? So that you have to be pretty diligent to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. But if you do, then you'll start seeing the next one, which is identifications of love, which was taught last week. And that's where what was normal to you might not be normal in the Bible. You might have been raised in a home with a lot of violence. You might have been raised in a home where you had no control over it, that one of your parents or both your parents were alcoholics, right? And now you're seeing all of this chaos going on on a regular basis, a lack of predictability. And children need predictability. They need rules. Life is chaotic enough for them just trying to figure out how it all works. And if they can't even count on a consistent answer from the main primary people in their lives, it feels like they're getting scrambled. But they could also identify, oh, I guess if a man loves a woman, he gets physically violent with her because that happens in my house all the time. That's not the God identification of true love. But if it seemed normal to you, you don't have a clue when, you, when it's time for you to get into a relationship. And you might not even realize it. You might be able to say in your mind, well, I know that's wrong. But there's another lever on the inside that says, yeah, but that's not as bad as what I saw growing up. But your friends who didn't grow up in that environment are like, why would you put up with that? So, oh, no, it's not that bad. He means well. He loves me. <laughs> and all of a sudden, there's no gauge. You don't have a benchmark to go back to of what the right normal would be. So we ask God, show me if there's an identification of love in my life that doesn't line up with the truth of your word. And I just don't realize I'm a victim of the circumstances I grew up in. And you might remember that I gave you that uh, link to Danny Silk's CD called, called Your Normal. Okay, it's a great example of identifications of love. Sherry was that girl. She grew up in a home with a lot of violence, and she was shut down when they got married. Danny grew up in a home where his mother had 30 different people living in their house over a course of like five-year period, right? So he had no connection with a man. He didn't know what it was like. He called it a uh, toolbox deficiency of what it would be like to be a father and a husband. And, and he called it, he had no man print. He didn't connect with anybody that he could look up to. So he was like this wandering guy out there. Who am I? What, who, how should I live? What's the right way to live? And it wasn't until he got into Bethel and he was surrounded by godly couples especially that he realized that a couple could even last more than 15 years. He didn't know anybody in his whole life that had been married more than 15 years. And now all of a sudden he was with people that were 30, 40 years together and counseling him. You know, some things are taught, but most things are caught. And when you get in a healthy culture and now you're surrounded, now he's just soaking it in. Like, oh, now I know what I can do with my wife, Sherry. And now they're amazing leaders. Like They've overcome tremendous obstacles in the natural because that's what God does. He gives you that ability no matter what's happened to you. And we really feel confident to say no matter what's happened to you, watch the Joyce Meyer video and, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Nobody would have ever asked for that situation, and yet here she is touching, I think, millions of people all over the world. When you add it all up, the incredible way God is using her. All right, so then we're here tonight, hearts of stone and inner vows. Next week will be healing victims of sexual abuse, then spiritual rebellion, slumbering spirit, and burden bearing. These are deeper topics than those first earlier topics, right? We wanted to lay a foundation for you, and, and you know, next week especially, very few things in life. There's very few traumas somebody could go through in life that changes the wiring of your life more. You know, the Bible says he'll make the crooked way straight. Well, you want to talk about a crooked way. Somebody that's been sexually abused has a really hard time trying to sort life out after that. It's such a violation. And, and it might manifest itself in many different ways. But again, as Christians, as people who love them, as the ones 
who Danny saw, let's just say we would rather be the ones that when that person comes into church, they could look at us and say, oh man, you're living a life that's so different than anything I ever saw and I want what you have. And we're saying, well, we were in the same boat when we walked in and somebody else helped us. So, you know, God's no respecter of persons. If he does it for one, he'll do it for all of us, right? So we want to know what the core issues are. And sometimes you just have to cry with people. You don't try to tell them all the 10 steps to get out of the problem they're in. They just need to mourn. They just need to grieve. And, and we'll talk a, a lot more about that in detail next week. But, you know, just recognize even what we're talking about tonight, I'm going to go a little faster than I normally do because I want to cover a lot of ground. So I hope you had coffee. I'll just say that. <laughs> just give the guy next to you a little elbow here, okay? <laughs> Stay awake. All right. So the, the next slide is that line that we just sang in that song by Chris Tomlin called Indescribable, and um, it's really based on that psalm that said, when I look at the stars, right, when I, oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, right? It's an amazing song, isn't it? That's a psalm of David when he was out on the backside of the mountain as a shepherd. He was out there with his guitar creating songs for God, and he says, what is man that you are mindful of him? And that's this last line in this song that's so powerful. You see the depths of my heart, and you love me the same. Like, that is such a powerful truth, isn't it? And he repeats it three times because it's so hard to believe that in spite of our flaws, he's not holding that against us. He's not making us climb back up the ladder. Well, maybe you'll get back in my good graces again. No. He's saying, as long as you're willing to accept the fact that you can change... I'm going to be here with you, and I'm going to partner with you in that. And for many of us, some of these inner vows that we made were so strong that we don't think we could change. That's a lie, okay? Any man be in Christ, new creation. All things pass away, all things become new. That's a repeating process, okay? And whatever area that you might have had arrested development, development in, and there's two ways there. It could have been because of your own poor choices, or it could have been a hand that you were dealt in life that you had nothing to do with. Either way, something has to change in order for you to have that upgrade that you need. You don't want the enemy having any hand in your life. Make no place. Give no place to the devil, right? So if he got a, a wedge in through some uncontrollable thing in my life, well, look, I can live in, in regret about that, or I could say I'm going to do whatever it takes to move on. This thing has had me long enough, and it's not that good. God is better than whatever that thing is that's trying to hold me back. And it's true, he is. So Psalm 139 is uh, a good one to look at. I only have a couple of verses here, but it says in the Passion Translation, Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. You perceive every movement of my heart and soul, and you understand my every thought before it even enters my mind. You read my heart like an open book. Can you say that with me? You read my heart like an open book. That's a good thing to remember. So if you think you're hiding something from him, the way you might hide it from a coworker or something, he knows already. He's just waiting for you to come to him and say, can you help me deal with this? And the answer is always yes. Uh, verse 13, you formed my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside. I like the way that's said, right? We are fearfully and wonderfully made is the way it says it in the King James Version. And, and it just... The creation of, of the heavens, when, when you get back to that psalm, and, and he says, when I consider the stars and, and how big the whole thing is, but then when I look at an infant out of the mouths of babes, it still flows worship. What David was realizing is that child is just as much of a miracle as, as the galaxies are. And we forget that. You see the depths of my heart, and you still love me the same. You created that whole thing up there that we can't even fathom, and yet you care that much about me too. What is man that you are mindful? Well, what we are is made in his image. Spectacular creation. C.S. Lewis said, you've never met an average person. Every person you've ever met is a miracle of God. I'm kind of paraphrasing him. But it's really hard to remember that sometimes, isn't it? Man, I don't know if you remember, but we had a guy come to the old church, Bishop Wilson. He did one of the men's conferences, and he was 94 years old. Still dressed really sharp, still spoke really well. I don't know, Eddie, do you remember? And he said, 
I found out in life that there's a little bit of God in everybody you meet. Some people you just have to look a lot harder than others to find them. <laughs> See, like that's a great thing to remember. So it might take you years to find that little piece of God that's in there, but they're made in his image, right? He learned a lot in that 94 years, right? Shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside, and you wove them all together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. <laughs> now, most men are not thanking God for making their wives so mysteriously complex. <laughs> but, but when we're talking about trying to help people grow and heal from wounds that they have, that's what we're saying often. I kind of coined that phrase here is, Lord, give me the combination to the lock of their heart. Like, show me what the complexity is and where this is, because you don't want them suffering any longer than they have to. And if we're effective ministers of the gospel and we're filled with your spirit, you know what they need. So help me get out of the way and speak through me and to them, and, and then let me hear when they talk to me what the real issue is underneath it all, because the goal is they walk out of here different than when they walked in. They leave that addiction behind. They leave that hatred, that bitterness behind, whatever it is, that bitter root judgment, we repent of it and we move on. And it says, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he removes that transgression. When you honestly repent, 1 John 1, 9, right? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from whatever the iniquity was that was attached to that thing. It's almost too good to be true, right? But it's your decision. And it takes some discipline to do this, right? Everything you do, he says, David, is marvelously breathtaking. It simply amazes me to think about it. It's what we just sang. Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Okay? Does anybody see the movie by Lee Strobel called The Case for Christ? This was the verse that, the, that the, the nurse, the woman, said, this is what you should pray for your husband, because Lee Strobel was a really hardened atheist, and he was fighting it. And she just kept praying this over, Lord, you said you would give him a heart of flesh for the heart of stone that he has. If you haven't seen that movie, I really recommend you, you get it. It's excellent. It's so well done. So in order for us to have true fellowship with others and with God, he has to pierce or melt our hearts of stone. It's easy to live behind the walls of the fortress that you build. You feel very safe, but you're not growing. And the only way for us to really grow in God is that we've got to come out from behind that fortress and we've got to start taking our armor off, right? It protects us, but it also prevents us. In our fallen condition, we're like medieval knights <laughs> in armor, peering out through the slits in our helmets, and we're slashing and poking at one another, secretly wishing that the other person would open up so we could really meet them. Okay? Now, I'm just going to say, as a general rule in my life, what I've experienced is women tend to let their guard down much faster with each other when they're friends. <laughs> if they don't like each other, man, they could drop some bombs. They could cut you with a knife so sharp you don't even know you've been stabbed <laughs> till you start seeing the blood. All with words, right? All with words. But when they like you, all of a sudden, like, they just open right up. When they, when they trust you, they'll just start really connected. Men, man, they got to go on four hunting expeditions, three fishing trips, <laughs> ten football games, and maybe you'll get a grunt, you know, of, yeah, that bothered me too. You know, <laughs> That's totally wrong for me to say that. You know, I'm, I'm totally exaggerating it. I'm just saying, though, there are different things about the way we were made up in our temperaments that do make it harder for men to just be honest about things because the culture has pounded us that if you show any flaws, you're weak. You have to be able to man up. What does that mean, man up? It means get ready to get physical with somebody if they get in your face. That's what's expected. You get picked on on the playground just to see what you're made of. You get onto a new job on a construction site, they're going to rip you for a while just to see how, how hard is this guy willing to push back. And can we depend on him? If we get in a jam, can we depend on him? Remember uh, Hacksaw Ridge? How wrong were they about him? Totally wrong. He was the bravest guy in the crew, even though they thought because he didn't want to carry a gun that he was going to hurt them, end up saving half their lives. So you're wrong with your first impression sometimes, right? You get that? So then it says, to best understand how hearts of stone relate to inner vows, think of the heart of stone as a walled fortress. 
Life goes on inside, but access is very limited and well guarded. Many try to scale the walls. Most are picked off by the skilled defenders. Do you get the analogy? We've learned all these tools will let you get just so close enough, but then all of a sudden the drawbridge goes up. Or that, that soldier on the, on the wall picks you off with, a, with an arrow, and you're like, oh boy, I don't know why I touched something there. I better not go back there anymore. Those who persevere, wanted to minister to the pain and loneliness inside, often find that, I love this, their scaling ladders are roughly pushed away from the walls. <laughs> right? I'm trying to get in, but I can't get in. Every time I get halfway up the ladder, I find myself on my back again because you keep pushing the ladder away. And, and that, look, it's been a long time since people have been in there. So they're, they're embarrassed to let you in and, let, and you know the truth. And that's another huge problem in our culture now, shame. Everything is a shame thing. Like, you, you can't make any mistakes online without getting a 1,000 replies and people retweeting the mistake that you make. It used to be when we were just with our friends. You made a mistake, okay, you'd get, they'd get you for a while, but they'd forget about it and you'd move on because we all make mistakes, right? Not, not that way anymore. And then it says some may even be invited in, but when they get too close, they will be thrown off the wall <laughs> and barred from the real life inside. So that's, that's the heart of stone is the fortress. And then he's saying inner vows, on the other hand, are the armor that we wear in the hope that it will protect us and empower us. Since, however, it was forged from judgments. Okay, see how the different topics are starting to connect now? saying that the armor that you're wearing is formed by the judgments and forged in the fire of your judgment. I can't trust people. They're not trustworthy. And that's the armor that I have on. But it says because of that, it chafes against us constantly and it actually attracts more hurt and abuse. How ironic is that? The law of sowing and reaping. You become the very thing you hated when there's a judgment in your heart. Easter's not in her head. How many times have we seen it, Easter? I swore I'd never be like my father. I'm just like my father. I swore I'd never be like my mother. And my four-year-old said something the other day, and I was like, oh, that's my mother in my four-year-old. I'm laughing because you have to keep a sense of humor about this, right? That's probably a sign that there's a judgment somewhere. And the very thing you didn't want, because you judged, now you're bound to reap that thing. Because whatever you sow, you're going to reap all right, so with, with it on, with the armor on, we're incapable of doing the work of the Lord, even when that's exactly what we want to do. An inner vow is a determination set by the mind and the heart into all the being in early life. Vows that we make currently also affect us, but the inner vow is the one that was set into us as children, and it's usually off the grid of our conscious mind. It's usually forgotten, but it didn't go away just because you forgot that it's there. Our inner being persistently retains such programming no matter what changes of mind and heart may later pertain. I'm sorry, I don't mean to make this too heady. I'm just trying to get you the principles here to lay the foundation. Because you might think, well, if I don't remember it, how, how will I ever be able to dredge it up to the surface? You ask the Lord. You ask the Lord, what inner vows have I made? What judgments have I made in my life that are now impacting me as an adult? And if you ask, he wants to answer, right? Ask and you'll receive. Uh, did I get that next one? Yeah, that programming. And then the distinctive mark of an inner vow is that it resists the normal maturing process. Okay, so um, I already said, uh, I alluded to the fact that you could have arrested development in a certain area. You could be doing really well in a lot of parts of your life, but this one area, it's almost like you revert to back to being a child again. That's, that's a sign of an inner vow. That's what they're saying. It resists the normal process of maturing. And we're going to give you a couple of examples of this, which I really want to get to tonight because it, it, it'll make it come alive for you. But think about 1 Corinthians 13, 11. It says, when I was a child, I used to speak as a child, think as a child, and reason as a child. But when I became a man, I did away with childish things. The inner vow stops that process from happening because until that thing is broken, until it's identified and broken, you can't progress. Intervals for this change, we don't grow out of them. Like a programming, oh, this is such a good analogy. Like the programming of a clock on a stove, they may not kick in, kick on until the time set by the vow. What does that mean? All right, so if you think being single is better, if I'm in the fortress, if I get married, then 
that all of a sudden I become husband instead of just single guy that can sleep on a Saturday afternoon on the couch, right? Or my grandfather used to say to my father with an Italian accent that I won't try to imitate, he said, Louie, be careful. She's going to get a ring in your nose and, and lead you around by your nose with a chain. They called that henpecked back in those days. One week, my father went with us to the Statue of Liberty. He took us to the Statue of Liberty, and all his friends were playing golf. And when he showed up the next week to play golf, they said, where were you? What happened? He goes, oh, I, I had a Statue of Liberty job. <laughs> like, I had to take my family. So for then on, for the next 40 years, this is all I heard. Somebody didn't show up. Oh, it was a Statue of Liberty job. Like, it was this terrible thing to have to be with your family because he was getting ribbed by his friends. <laughs> So it's like the programming on the clock. I have a vow against my mother, but when I'm single, it doesn't impact me. But as soon as I get married and I have a child, now I become a mother, and this clock on the stove kicks in. <laughs> I know you deal with this all the time. <laughs> they may rest totally forgotten and dormant, these things, until they're triggered by the right person or the right situation. Haven't forgotten them, we're unaware they exist or could have any effect, but they affect us like a railroad track affects a train. The conscious mind may be very good engine, but it can only run on the track that the inner vow set for it in childhood. No matter which way the engineer may desire to go, the train will not change direction unless someone switches the tracks. Who might that be? Jesus, Holy Spirit. God the Father, loving Christians that are around you that want the best for you, no agenda. We'll work through this thing with you. We had a similar situation in our life. God set us free. Who the Son sets free is not partially free. He can do it because he can. Boys soon learn that mothers have memories like elephants. <laughs> no offense to any of the ladies here. That's actually a compliment. So here's an example of what happens in a little boy's heart. Okay, this is a really like practical part of this. They discover that whatever you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. <laughs> Often whatever emotion that hangs out noticeably good or bad will be used by mama to control. So one of the examples I didn't put on here but that they use in the book is a young boy, you know, going out with their friends. We used to actually be able to do this. We used to be able to go out with our friends on a Saturday morning without an adult around. I don't know, that's getting pretty rare these days. But we would go look for rope swings in the woods. We would tie it up. We would swing across the river. Just be, have a blast, right? So when you come home and you're going to eat lunch, and she looks down and says, what happened to your jeans? Why did you rip your jeans? And you're like, Mom, we found the coolest place. We put a rope swing up. We were swinging across. It was so much fun. I'm going right back as soon as I finish lunch. What does she say? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so, right? I brought you in the world. <laughs> you know the rest of it, right? So all of a sudden, like, you make up some lie the next time because, oh, a dog attacked me on the way home. Green teeth, because, you know, they could see the stain marks on your knee, right? You get all kinds of creative because if you told the truth, now you're not going to be able to hang out with your friends, okay? And I'm really kind of exaggerating it a little here, but not much. It says, I'm going to read it again. Often whatever emotion hangs out noticeably, good or bad, could be used by mama to control us. So boys learn to hide from their mothers. The less she knows, the better. <laughs> Whatever she knows may be hauled up for criticism or scolding weeks, months, or elephant years later. Because she never forgets. <laughs> Though all this is normal, sometimes the situation is so tense or the reaction is so vehement that the boy forms a most obstinate inner vow. Never share what you really feel with a woman not just mom, because it's not safe. Keep the wall up, heart of stone, fortress, armor. You're not getting in because you're going to use it against me later. So we'll just be roommates. <laughs> later in life, when chromosomes and hormones change a boy's aversion to girls, he may want to share, but what? Find himself unable. Most likely, he'll find it easy to communicate with girls until what happens? He gets married, and the clock on the stove goes, bzz, bzz, bzz. <laughs> okay, you were single, now you're married. Things are trying to change. 
The armor binds and fetters us with our judgments against others, and we head for certain defeat in battle. Okay? So, look, I'm not meaning to make paint it such a bad picture, but this is really common to man. Like, they make the statement in the book, all of us have made some kind of inner vow at some point in our life. All of us have some level of performance orientation. So it's not like we're condemning you here and saying you have this life sentence on you. No, we serve a God who heals, the God of the miracles. He, it's who he is. He does miracles. He causes change to happen in our lives. So I'll get through this one, but I want to spend a little time on a handout that I gave you that says examples of inner vows. And I want to also just share some of our own experience here as a church. Somebody asked me, like, you know, it would be good if you share the vision a little bit of the church and how the church was founded because some of us are newer and we don't really, you know, understand how it happened. But what did happen with me and my wife, Tricia, was that we grew up in a, in a healthy church as far as a good teaching, Bible-based, prayed for the sick, you know, really good training. But there wasn't necessarily the, the, the freedom to say I'm dealing with a problem because dealing with a problem was back translated into weakness. I, I don't think intentionally, but that was the result. So she ended up doing a lot of her, her ministry work was in the church, helping counsel people that were dealing with problems. And she was the one that originally introduced me to the Sanfords, and, and it was a real eye-opener for us. And we said, you know, when we go start our church, we're going to have right from day one, we're going to help people understand that all of us need work on something. It's not this sign that you're a great Christian because you never get sick and you never have any problems and you never argue with your spouse. That's not reality, okay? And Jesus wouldn't have made it that way. It's not an impossible goal that we're shooting for here. He understands everything about us. In all ways, he was made like us, yet without sin. So honestly, if he's the spirit of truth, if his Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, why should we lie to each other? If you ask me how I'm doing, and I say, well, I'm really struggling with something, that's not a sign of weakness. That's a sign of strength. If I can't say it to you, so you could say back to me, I'm, I'll pray with you. So that's what we did from the very first week that we started. The first Bible studies we were teaching kind of encapsulated this idea that we're all a work in progress. We're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. You'll never fully reach it until we get to the other side, but it's a great goal in life is to be transformed into his image. And that's part of the compliment somebody could pay you. I've known you 20 years. You're very different than you used to be in a better way. Well, that's because this process works. If you work it, it will work. All right, so you see where it says examples of intervals? John and Paul Sanford, let's just go through this. I'm going to take my time a little bit to help you understand where they're coming from. So it says, a woman came to us who could not bear a male, a male child. Several times she had become pregnant and had miscarried boys about the third or fourth month. Gynecologists could find no physical cause. She wanted fervently to give her husband a son. We asked concerning her life with her father and could find some hurts, but her reactions didn't seem great enough to create such a destructive obviously psychosomatic condition. So maybe not obvious to you, but do you understand what they're saying? Like if you keep miscarrying boys in the third or fourth month, once, maybe twice, uh, not a coincidence, three or four times, that's what they mean by psychosomatic. That They had learned by this point there was probably an inner vow in this girl's spirit somewhere back there related to this. They didn't have clarity on it yet, but they kept digging, right? That's what we do hopefully in a way that's not painful. We're not trying to hurt anybody when we're digging. We're not saying we were psychiatrists that are going to relive all your past. We're looking for patterns. Go from the fruit on the surface back to the root. So they asked about the father, and there wasn't much there, and nothing to cause that. But then her brother, however, it says, was not like the usual sibling who teases because he loves. This brother was vicious continually embarrassing and physically hurting her. Her father had failed to protect her. She remembered then, at about 9 or 10 years old, walking beside a river, picking up stones, hurling them into the water, crying out, I'll never carry a boy child. I'll never carry a boy child. That's an inner vow. She hadn't remembered that until she got into a prophetic counseling situation. Why do I say prophetic? Because if we're only giving you the questionnaire to fill out, and we're following a bunch of rules, you took the Spirit of God out of the process. And look, that's risky. 
And I'll, I'll be honest, that's part of the big lesson that I learned from my wife is how to walk in a prophetic lifestyle, how not to have to know all the answers ahead of time. Because in the business world, you're supposed to know all the answers. If you go to a lawyer and you're paying him $500 an hour, or her, $500 an hour, she's not supposed to look at you and say, I don't know. <laughs> you're paying them to know. So that's kind of the culture. If you're the pastor, you're supposed to know. <laughs> and when in doubt, fake them out. No, that's not right. But that's what some people do. <laughs> to admit that I don't know, like, no, then, then you're less than. Well, yeah, but we're all less than somewhere. Let's just be honest with each other. So she hadn't remembered this, but because it was a prophetic atmosphere, that's, that's the emphasis I'm trying to make here, is that from the beginning, before the lady even walked in the office, John and Paula were asking the Lord, Lord, you know this girl. You know everything about her. She's fearfully and wonderfully made, complex, intricate. Lord, we don't want to spend four years trying to get to the root of this thing. You can show us. Where, how do we get there fast so that we're not wasting her time and your time because there's another hundred people that want to come in? And if it's just off of some manual or somebody else's program that you're trying to use, you don't own it. You have to hear from God yourself. But, boy, isn't that a model for all of us? You know, the old church, the, people, the reason Martin Luther was so objecting to it was they were basically telling to people, don't read your Bible, you need us. Like, create codependency. You remember that when I told you what codependency means by Jack Frost? Two ticks, no dog. <laughs> Think about that one for a minute, okay? So we're going to make you dependent on us because then you'll have to keep coming back. It would almost be like a psychiatrist who's only leading you on just enough, but you never get healed because you're like an annuity. You keep coming back and paying. Well, that's not God. He wants you healed because the healed people go heal other people. He wants all of us walking in health, right, and healing. I can't take my identity out of the fact that you need me. You don't need me. You need him. Yeah. See? It's one of these things. It's a conduit idea. And that's what Trisha helped me understand really, really well. Like, you just pray. You stay current. You don't get caught up in all the little distractions. And you hear God on behalf of the people. Because he, while they're talking to you, he's talking to you too about them. And that's that conduit idea. Not so easy. I, it took me a while to figure that out with her, but she was patient. <laughs> so you get to this vow that she makes. Hadn't remembered it. And now all of a sudden, in this prophetic atmosphere, she remembers, oh, yeah, I have this picture in my mind of walking. Now, do you think that didn't have anything to do with the prayer? Of course it was related. Lord, show her. Help her remember what the root of this thing is, right? And now all of a sudden, she's skipping rocks. I'll never carry a boy child. I'll never carry a boy child. And look, when I first heard this, I thought, well, OK. She made a vow, but she was a 9-year-old kid. How could that have such a big impact? But that's how fearfully and wonderfully made you are. It's a vow. You made a vow. I'm never going to do this. You mean to tell me your words would have strength over your body and cause you to miscarry? I had a hard time believing that, but I, I've come to learn that it was true in an example right here in our church. We learned it firsthand. All right, so what does it say? This was an inner vow, a directive sent through the heart and mind into the body. Though the conscious mind had long forgotten, the inner being had not forgotten. Get it? So just because it wasn't in her conscious mind, her spirit man knew. Though she now wanted to give birth, the earlier programming was still intact and functioning. You getting the language here? How powerful your words are, good and bad. See, and Trisha was saying that Sunday, right? The power of our decrees. That's what this whole theme of this year is about. Well, you've got an inner voice in there too. It might not be coming out of your mouth, but what are you saying on the inside? That's about capturing every thought, right? We took up authority in I'm sorry. Yeah, we took up authority in Christ. This is John and Paula talking now. Knowing that whatever we loose is loosed. You know that one, right? Whatever you bind on earth, whatever you loose on earth. That's Matthew 16. Having pronounced forgiveness for her hatred for her brother and induced her to forgive, we spoke directly to her body even as Jesus rebuked the fever in Luke chapter 439, okay? So they're speaking to her body and saying, you are not under the power of that vow anymore. You are free. Because it sounds a little funny rebuking a fever, doesn't it? Can the fever hear you? 
Does it have ears? Well, it's a spiritual principle. There's authority that we're given, and we speak to that thing. You could speak to somebody's heart if it's not properly operating and say, I command you to operate according to the way God designed you, and that crooked way is going to be made straight. Now, you might think that's a crazy way to pray, but it's very biblical. You'll find many examples. And there it goes. We commanded her body to forget that hateful order and return to the original command of God to subdue and fill the earth. Get it? They knew. Genesis 1.28 says, be fruitful and multiply. So God wanted her to bear children, wanted her to bear a son. Mentioning subdue was a polite way of reminding the body as part of nature to obey the voice of the Lord. Even as Jesus commanded the waves and the winds, and they obeyed him. We prayed comfort and healing for her heart and spirit and for her body. In the prayer, we visualized her being able to produce a healthy, normal baby boy. She did conceive and carried a full term, a normal, healthy son. That makes it real, right? To see the power that had. I'm going to tell you another one that they did that I didn't write it out here, but it was really hard for me to grasp until we saw a similar thing happen here. A, a girl was traumatized as, as a 11 or 12 years old. Uh, some some type of sexual abuse. I don't remember the exact details about it, but she made a vow that she would never grow into an adult woman. Now, do you think that, that your vow could ever be strong enough to stop your body from growing? It did. She didn't develop. She was 17, 18 years old, and she still looked much younger because her body was refusing to cooperate with the growth. Now, I, I, was, I said, no way. That can't be true, right? They prayed. They found the root. The, the same way, and through the prophetic process, the Lord revealed the root. They broke the power of that vow over her life. She had to ask the Lord to forgive her for making that vow, even though it came through trauma. And within a couple of years after that prayer, she accelerated, her growth accelerated, and her body changed and developed into a full woman. Okay? Fast forward 10 years after we heard that. It was a night like tonight. We had the prayer ministry team up here, and somebody had her arm around somebody walking up the aisle down the middle here, and I thought it was a 12-year-old girl. It was a college student. And she wouldn't, couldn't look in the eye. She just was really shut down. And, you know, that's a little challenging when, when you're seeing somebody that's clearly in a lot of pain, and it's emotional pain. It's not physical pain. I won't go into all the details with you, but we did a very similar process to what we just described here. Married, baby, body accelerated and grew from what looked like a 12-year-old girl into a beautiful young woman. So I'm telling you, I know it might sound a little strange. The power of your words, you probably underestimate the power of your words, because if we really understood the spiritual principles, we'd be a lot more careful about what comes out of our mouth. Okay? You still with me? Yeah. All right. Good deal. So um, you know what? Let's look on the back side of that one handout, the guy in prison with the ball and chain around his leg. We have found this to be a helpful little graphic. I think of it a lot, don't you? You know, when you have a picture in your mind. And uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's a good way to just to see what type of inner vows that people would make. And then you see on the top it says, I will never. And then below his feet, what does it say? I will. So always and never are not good words to use when it comes to relationship. You never do this. You always do that. And it's usually got a little edge on it, doesn't it? Because there you go. That's a judgment because you're saying that they can't change. They never do it. Never. Basically saying God can't change you because you're beyond help. <laughs> Nobody's beyond help. So it can't be never and can't be always. You're basically just saying I bailed on you. That's a violation. Don't do it. So I will never, you can get down the list with me, right? Let anyone love me. I will never be weak. I will never trust anyone. I will never allow myself to need blank, period. I won't allow myself to need anything. I'll never let them take anything away from me. I'll never allow anyone to touch me, share what is mine. I'll never allow anyone to give me money. Write, read, understand. You could think about it. It's endless the vows that people could make that are still impacting them. And then on the bottom, I will always remain aloof. I will always be logical. I'll always be in control of my life. And a lot of it is a coping mechanism for people that have been traumatized. And we'll talk about this a little bit more next week too, but sometimes 
women that have been sexually violated have a, a, an obsession with controlling their environment. So they're cleaning all the time or they're, uh, I won't go into too many details right now, but things that you might not tie back, you know, the behavior that you might not tie back to a sexual abuse situation manifests itself because they were not in control. Now they have to be in control in order to feel safe. And it's just so demonic. And it's so beautiful to see people come out of that prison and just, you know, the real person come back to life and just blossom again and not be bound by that thing. All good? There's that line there. You see that line? If we go back to the handout I gave you, it says, getting to the inner vow, especially when it's a vow not to share, can involve overcoming many character structures that have been assembled to hide and protect the person from hurt. All right, so I'm gonna read it again, because why would it be a vow not to share? It's that little boy, right, that told his mother the truth, got in trouble for it, told her the truth, got in trouble for it. He said, I'm not sharing anything anymore. Name, rank, and serial number. That's it. She's not getting any facts from me because she uses it against me. So you see how hard it is? If it's a vow not to share, and you're asking them to share. So you need a pole vault to get over that wall. So what they're saying, getting to that inner vow, especially when it's a vow not to share, can involve overcoming many character structures. What would that be? What would a character structure be? It's like a habit that you develop that as soon as somebody starts getting close, you know to back off. It's like blinking your eyes. You don't even think about it. It's become so natural to you. Like, you automatically know how to change a conversation because they're starting to get too close to the sensitive part that you don't want them getting near, okay? That's a character structure. It's been assembled to hide and protect the person from hurt. There may be, for example, a heart of stone, right? We talked about that already. Big wall, big fortress. Or this is a mouthful, but watch what it says. Unconscious, evasive, and defensive habitual flight mechanisms. Say that 10 times fast. Wow, that's pretty complicated, isn't it? Get to the whole thing. Unconscious, evasive, and defensive habitual flight mechanisms. Unconscious means it's automatic. It's just a thing they've gotten so accustomed to to evade the, the person who's trying to hunt them down and get to the real truth. It's habitual, and it's unconscious, and it's to evade and defend. And it's a flight mechanism so that that person can't get close enough to find out the real truth about me. Because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. So when we get hurt, all of this complex program that we have can be used to stop our healing. Because we're too afraid to try to let that back out of the box. So then it says it could be automatically trigger an anger, a bitter root expectancy, or there could be key words or phrases or actions that stimulate automatic reactions, deep anxieties, and fear. I know that's a mouthful between those two lines, but that's why I give you these handouts to look at too. Let me just give you a couple of practical ones. I was at, uh, I worked for a very big investment banking firm and I was helping run conferences for them and the, the motivational speaker they had for one of the conferences was a guy named Marcus Luttrell, who wrote the book Lone Survivor, okay? He was a Navy SEAL. He was in Afghanistan with three other men in his group. There was four of them there that were there on a mission. The other three guys died. He's the lone survivor. But not only did the other three guys die, 18 people were killed on a plane coming to get him. So he felt responsible for 21 people dying. But he's 6'5", 240-pound Navy SEAL. <laughs> He walks into the hotel where we're having this big conference and he's got this really stone face on him and there's a golden retriever running alongside him. This is in a big, you know, beautiful hotel. I'm like, what the heck's a dog doing in here? It wasn't connecting for me yet. You know what it was? It was because of post-traumatic stress. The dog, like if they were walking down the street and a car backfired and he pictured that being a gunshot going off, he could be triggered but somehow the dog is trained to sense when that happens because you emote some kind of stress hormone and they're, they're trained to start licking your hand to let you know this isn't real. I'm bringing you back to reality. Wow. Think about that. Talk about fearfully and wonderfully made. That's how well they understand how complicated this stuff is, right? That, you know, he had to be, the dog had to be with him. And after listening to him speak for an hour, there wasn't a dry eye in the house 
it, it was really intense. And all you wanted to do was stand up and salute this guy for the courage that it took for him to make it. And, and the thing is, why it was so motivational is because there was a hundred times in the story that any normal person would have just quit. There was no way in the natural he was getting out of there. When, when you hear the facts of the story, the movie didn't really do a great job, I didn't think, after hearing him and reading the book. Uh, that's not my point. The point is that we will develop these coping mechanisms and we could get triggered by something that's totally not even on our conscious mind. But the Lord will show it to you. That's, that's the good news here, right? The Lord will show it to you. He was still beating himself up, this guy, about the fact that all these other people died because of him trying to come and get him. He was beating himself up about it. And I wanted to say, you need inner healing, man. You need to come to our church and get some counseling. I hope he gets it because he's a really, he's a hero. Amazing. All right, you ready for another one? And then we'll wrap it up because I know what time it is. We're getting near. Time to pray. See where it says little girls were created? So we talked about the boy. We talked about a possible vow that a little boy could have. That made sense to you, right? I'm not going to reveal anything. It's going to be used against me, so I don't, I don't talk in detail to my wife or any, any woman, right? That's a, that's a lie. Little girls were created to be the apple of their daddy's eyes. They come to earth innately knowing they are God's gift to ravish their daddy's heart, to comfort, delight, and please. Being received by an appreciative father builds confidence in what will be, is to be a woman. A wife can only fulfill her husband from her own sense of beauty and desirability. Stop. Do you believe that? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. That's why I asked. This is, this is a pretty radical statement they're making, isn't it? What, what's the concept? Is... Uh, when I'm married, if, if I want a strong marriage, the better my wife is doing, the better our marriage is going to be doing, right? If I can confirm her in who she is and make her know how much I value her and appreciate her, and she's here, so I hope I'm doing these things. <laughs> she's holding up cards in the back, six, four, <laughs> nine. <laughs> she didn't do that, thankfully. That's a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? He's talking about the ideal, like what you would want before you get married. And you say, man, when I'm a parent, I hope I can put such a love in my daughter for who God made her to be that she'll be so secure that when she marries, her husband can be fully fulfilled in that marriage because of how secure she is. That's basically what he's saying. A father is the one who builds confidence in what it means to be a woman. A wife can only fulfill her husband from her own sense of beauty and desirability. If she knows she's a precious gift of God to her husband, she can bless him restfully with herself. If she doesn't, and therefore requires, flip it over, constant stated approval and reaffirmation. Okay? You know what they're talking about here, right? Like, am I doing a good job? Am I doing a good job? Like, they may not be saying that, but their actions are, are indicating that. You go to somebody's house for a party and they're just bustling around and they're so nervous and worried that everything's got to be perfect because their identity is in performing well. But when the person's secure in who they are, they'll perform way better because they won't be nervous about trying to perform. If you ever hear somebody singing, you know, up here, if they're nervous, what happens? It all gets tight. And you can hear it in the voice, but when, like... You don't see us look too nervous up here most of the time because we're having such a blast. <laughs> because by the time you get here, we've had two hours of playing already. We're here at start at like 8 o'clock in the morning. So by 10, we're like fourth gear. Like, we're ready. Let's go. <laughs> I'm going to miss that more than anything else. When I have to stop doing that, I have, this is how my brain works. I, there's going to have to be a day that I'm going to have to stop. And I'm like, no. That's the thing I'm going to miss the most because it just makes me come alive. It's just amazing. I love it. So that's not my point here. It's that she, right, she needs to know with, if she's, if the, the symptom would be I need constant reaffirmation for you. That's letting me know that you don't feel good about yourself because you need me to keep reaffirming you. And guess what? It's never going to be enough. No matter how many times you ask me, I'm going to say the same thing. And what happens to the guy says she becomes a wearisome burden to her man. He always must prove to her anew that she is desirable to him. That wears him out. 
So then he becomes vulnerable to some siren, you know, quote unquote, that is confident of her desirability. Unfortunately, all too many fathers are unaware of their value. Now, we need to read that again, okay? Fathers don't realize the value that they are in their daughter's lives. And the, if they don't get it from their dad, it's going to be a counterfeit version from somebody else, okay? Rendering them unable to get past their own self-centeredness, the father now, and recognize the need their daughters have to be fathered. Too many times little girls have bounded joyfully into their daddy's presence only to be ignored or pushed away. New dresses were not noticed. Or dad only said, yeah, it's okay. Or to mama. What did that cost? Men, to her, eventually became regarded as dumb, off-base, not noticing or knowing where life really is, which can turn into an inner vow that says, don't let him really have or know all of you. It only ends up in pain because he doesn't get it. So I'll play the game, but I'm never really going to let you get too far inside because I don't think you can grab it anyway. So we'll just go through the motions. That's not God's best, is it? Oh, man, that is not intimacy. That's not loving up on each other and being a, a force for good for each other and enforcing each other. So sharing means, this is, again, you got to think about this. It means from then on, first, that the wife wants to share his life, right? That's not the right way. It's not just supposed to be that she's just sharing his. He's supposed to be sharing hers, too. But she put up a wall because she's afraid of that. To know him and talk about him, not the other way around. And second, the inner vow makes a clever game of what she does share with her husband. She may share enough of her and give enough to him to convince herself that she is open and sharing, unaware that she's unconsciously, carefully controlled how much she's sharing. Now, I know it sounds like a lot to try to process, but man, this is life. And, and these are how these hindrances slow us down from the optimum way that God wants us to live. And he's not hiding this stuff from us if we're asking him. He'll give you the combination to the lock, as I said earlier. All right, now this is a pretty heavy statement coming up. Add to that the fact that in America, one out of five women has been molested or worse by some trusted man, father, grandfather, stepfather, brother, uncle, or cousin. When little girls broadcast their desire to be seen and held, many men receive the signals but interpret them at a carnal level. And they fail to honor the call to be fathers and honorable men who can love a girl to life as a desirable woman. How did the Super Bowl halftime show contribute to this problem? You wonder why? If, it's, if that's the norm in our culture, that it's so corrupted compared to what the Bible tells us on how we're supposed to live, right? So they respond sexually and thus violate not only the girl's body, but her precious ability to trust herself openly to be her own lovely person with the right man. From that moment of molestation, she may fear to let the beauty of what she is shine for fear the result will be nastiness. Whether she becomes frigid or promiscuous, we can see that the same root is responsible, an inability to give herself fully to the man of her life. Very profound. Two completely opposite behaviors, the result of the same trauma, right? Either why bother being careful anymore? My innocence is gone. I'm just going to be promiscuous because my life's not worth much or the opposite way, never letting anybody near me, right? All a plan of the devil to the max to rob us of our real identity. All right, then the second to the last paragraph says, the fullness of transformation cannot be achieved without resurrection. A woman whose father never loved her to life, that's the expression, you're loving the person to life, <clears throat> may come to know herself outwardly as beautiful and desirable and even flaunt it while inwardly feeling ugly and undesirable. But a truly confident person does not need to flaunt flirting or any hint of making use of sexual allurement is usually a dead giveaway to inner arid deserts and distress, right? Because when you're fully confident in yourself, you don't feel the need to have to have every man in the room look at you when you walk in. 
But if you're not feeling good about yourself, that's this counterfeit version of attention. And you know, even there again, when I was growing up, people didn't get a lot of plastic surgery, but it seems like it's really rampant now, right? I mean, really rampant. Never heard of Botox when I was growing up. But people are so hung up about their appearance. That's not the secure person. Your appearance is part of it uh, and a part that fades, right? So the word tells us, no, build your character. That's what's going to shine through. The God in you comes through in your character, and then the appearance glows because he's in you, right? So no matter how many things come to death on the cross, lasting results cannot happen without resurrection. Resurrection happens only by love. A person cannot come to life without being loved to life. And then in 1 John 4, 19, it says, we love him because he first loved us. This little girl needs a father, yet this creates a terrible vulner vulnerability between the counselor and the counselee. We must all guard our hearts and keep the cross between us all. I gave that to you for a reason because there's a lot in there. I hope you can go back over it. I told you it's kind of a setup for next week, which is a very difficult subject to cover, but an important one to cover. Not an easy one to preach on a Sunday morning, but certainly something we should be talking about in church in a setting like this. So let's just look at what's up on the screen now. Um, it's examples of inner vows, and maybe you know this is a little bit of what we've already covered, but this this first one was you know from their book, but it was one that I dealt with as a child because my father had a really bad temper, and I'll never get angry like my dad. Well, guess what? I saw symptoms of that when we got married, in the beginning of our marriage, and I'm like, this isn't who I want to be. And I was a Christian at the time, but I just had that root hadn't been revealed. And Trisha can remember and tell you some horror stories of things that I did that I, I just wasn't in control of myself. I wasn't aware of what the root was. It was almost like an involuntary thing. I saw it happen so many times when I was growing up and lived in fear of it, frankly, that that was a, a way that seemed normal to me. Or revenge. I'll get my mother back for doing that to me. This was a joke that me and my mother used to have because um, I didn't like the way she drove. <laughs> she hated making left turns. So if we had to go there, she would make a right, and then a right, and then a right, and go the other block this way down here, and go here, and then she'd finally get back to here. And all you had to do was make a left. One left would have been fine. When you drive, you do what you want. When I'm driving, we're doing it the way I want. We had this conversation a lot. So when I got her in the passenger seat when I was driving, left, 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 left. Not good, but that was the immaturity, right? I was holding on to that thing. I'm going to get her back for doing that to me. <laughs> yeah, well, she, she got me saved, so that all changed. <laughs> Or, you, you know, there's just a bunch here. I will never allow that to happen in my house. Guess what? The thing that you hated, you become. When I become a parent, I'll never do this. And then this one seems more rampant today than ever. I will not grow up. There was actually a book written about this called The Peter Pan Syndrome, Men Who Have Never Grown Up. And if you ever go back over that little story of Peter Pan, that's exactly what it's about. Yeah, you're the king, but you're the king of Never Never Land which is video games for the rest of my life, right? I don't want to face the realities that life, face, that life hands me. All right, so um, there's just a couple more to go, and then I want to go through the prayer because that's worth spending some time on. And we do have some prayer ministry people here tonight. Yes? Good. So, yeah, so we'll have enough people to pray. So I'm going to go back to that marriage scenario that I told you when the clock kicks on. Right, and he had, we're back to the boy that was stuffing a lot of things because he couldn't trust his mother. She was using it against him. And, and we said that he doesn't even realize why he's withholding from his wife, goes all the way back to that thing that happened as a child, right? So it says, at the top says, marriage puts the woman in a position to trigger that inner vow because now she's basically replacing his mother. Right? How did, the, how did your pants rip turns into why is the credit card bill so high this month? <laughs> right? So you fill in the gap. There's a million ways that we could not tell the whole truth to each other. 
Tell the truth, the whole truth. <laughs> right? So now marriage puts the woman back in the position of the mother that he created this inner vow about. Triggers in him, inner vows, made that, that were relative to the primary males in his life, a mother, a grandmother, or a sister. Frequently, couples have come for counseling perplexed by the fact that they had good communication until when? <laughs> until the honeymoon. And then her complaint is, he won't tell me anything anymore. The evening conversation might be like her. Hi, honey. How was your day? Fine. Just fine. Tell me about it. What do you want to know? <laughs> How did it go? What happened today? Just great. It went just great. You see, it's a little kid. He don't want to tell her how he got the rip in his pants because he doesn't want to be used against her, him. In no way, look, this is so powerful. In no way does he know that his inner being has no intention to share what's really on his heart. Why? Because what's controlling? The vow. You made it. It's your voice. You have authority over your own spirit. Until you break it, until the Lord heals it, that's the thing that's going to be in control. Unknown to him or her, an earlier program has kicked in. Even if he hears his wife and is wounded and perplexed about his inability to be vulnerable to her, on his own, he's not able to change his heart to open and share, okay? Because it's a spiritual transaction, so it takes a spiritual a cure. It takes the power of God to break that thing, and that's what they say. This is powerful here. He may repent a dozen times only to return automatically to the same pattern. The problem is that his repentance in the present concerning his wife can overcome the earlier programming that the vow he made concerning his mother. You with me? Tracking? The repentance is real, but it's for the wrong sin. That's an important concept, isn't it? But I repented 15 times. Yeah, because you're not realizing the devil's a good liar. You think you could change your behavior. You never got to the root. The real problem is the vow you made a long time ago, right? So the repentance is real, but it's for the wrong sin. The repentance and prayer needed is for the childhood resentments towards his mother. So, Lord, please forgive me for not honoring my mother, for writing her off, for saying I can't trust her, so I'm not going to be honest with her when I come home. That's a, that's a sin that needs to be repented of. But then also... I need God through the counselors and through my prayer to, to break that inner vow. I, I, I renounce it. It wasn't God. It was the wrong thing to do. I renounce it. I break the power of that inner vow that was set into my being. And then we get uh, granted forgiveness by the prayer minister that's with us. Amen? How you doing? Going to come back next week? Yeah. All right. Just checking. You know, just checking. All right, so I'd like to spend a little time on the prayer, okay? Good with that? It's 8.28, so i got two minutes. I'm going to take a little bit longer. So you're Christian, so you have to forgive me. But it's good to stand when we do the prayer, okay? And then if the prayer ministry team could come up, I'd appreciate that because uh, we don't want to shortchange that. Here's what we found over the years that after you read about something like this, that you maybe didn't have language for it before, but now it starts, things start to pop up in your spirit and you say, oh, that's what that is. I didn't know what to call it, but now I know what to call it. And the Lord will start revealing things to you. So we, we just encourage you to journal, write things down. And that one little piece that he gives you might not be enough on its own, but when you start to link some of these different clues together that he's giving you, you'll start to see a pattern. Um, remember that girl didn't remember herself by the river throwing those stones until she was in that environment. So that's how God works. So we'll read it out loud together, but I might just stop along the way at a couple points uh, just to make a point here. So it says a prayer for what? A heart of flesh. Okay, ready? Let's pray together. Lord, I've developed a defense to keep myself from being seen. I've built a hiding place to protect myself from hurt. I know that this protection, quote unquote, blocks out the love, warmth, and nurture I need. I come to you because I'm helpless to change. Come into my life, take down the wall. I want you to be my defense. Lord, help me to become vulnerable to risk. So if you would, just pause for a minute now, okay? 
if any of that was true that you just said, and probably is for a lot of us, try to think back to why it happened. What caused the wall to go up? People calling you names, making fun of you, family members that were bullying you. Nicknames are brutal, right? Like they paint a picture for you that just sticks with you. So it's good to forgive them. It's like, I'm letting that thing go. I'm not going to hold that against them. I forgive them for doing that to me. That made me have to put up a wall of defense. And the Holy Spirit's really good at showing you these things. We don't have to rush through these. And then it says, all right, ready? Lord, I forgive those people who have wounded me, and I forgive you, Lord, for allowing these wounds in my life. I also forgive myself for my sinful reactions and for building this heart of stone. Stop again, please. <laughs> it's a really uh, a lot in that one little paragraph there. Part of The first part's not so hard to understand. I forgive the ones who wounded me. But to say I forgive you, Lord, that sounds like a little bit of a contradiction, doesn't it? But if any part of our heart is wondering, how did he let that happen to me? That's why I want you to watch the Joyce Meyer testimony, right? She addresses that exact question. Where was God in all of this, okay? And she does a better job than I can. So really try to pull that out before we get together again next week. It'll really help. And then the last one, not, not taught on enough, I don't think, about our need to forgive ourselves. I forgive myself for my sinful reactions. In any other way, I've judged myself or made an inner vow about the unworthiness of my own life. Because, God, you see the depths of my heart, and you love me the same. <laughs> Remember? And now I'm not even doing that to myself. You're an amazing God. That whole song takes on a whole new meaning, doesn't it? Man, and you love me the same. All right, ready? Father, please forgive me for my sinful responses and for the way in which I have hurt loved ones by keeping them out of my life. I repent for the destruction in my own life and for wounding you with my sin, Lord. All right, and this isn't meant to be like self-flagellation, like you're not beating yourself up. You're just saying, you know what, like I said earlier, the devil has stolen from me enough. Over. Done. Basta. That's what Cindy Jacobs likes to say. Enough. It's finished now. I'm not going to keep living at 80% when he wants me at 100%. And holding this stuff back to protect myself hasn't been protecting me. It's been stunting me, and I'm going to have enough courage to step out. All right? And then, it, it, you know, I like what it says. I repent for the destruction of my own life. The destruction is I never grew the way I was supposed to because I stunted my own growth. And um, all right, let's just read the next paragraph. Ready? Lord, as an act of my will, I choose to be connected with others within my family and the body. I want to be intimate. Forgive me, Jesus, for not trusting the love offered me by my spouse, children, and fellow Christians. Help me to see and appreciate the gifts of others. Put a guard on my lips that I may build up instead of tear down. Help me hear the warnings or rebukes as love and not as rejection. Help me to hold myself in vulnerable position of receiving ministry, not just offering it. I ask you to bring people into my life who know how to love unconditionally and still have the courage to hold me accountable. Bring to death my heart of stone and give me... Well, you could spend some time on this prayer, couldn't you? So that last paragraph, just saying, as an act of my will, I choose to be connected with other people. That may take a little while, right? Because if you've spent so many years perfecting your defense mechanisms, these have to be deconstructed now. And you have to break lies that say you're safer by don't even try to engage. Just keep an arm's, arm's length distance. That's the better of the two evils. <laughs> but by saying I'm willing to be vulnerable again, you're saying I'm probably going to get hurt again. But that risk is lower than just con con constantly hiding behind my wall, OK? And then to break an inner vow, ready? The person receiving ministry would say, I renounce the vow, and you would name it specifically, because the Lord will show you. 
He's really good about this. He'll show you. And the reason it's good to be in the prayer room and, and with prayer ministers is they can then say, by the power and authority of Jesus, I break this vow. I command your spirit and body to remember it no longer. You are free, restored to your original design. You are no longer required to feel, think, act according to this vow. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. All right, so here's the deal. The world is waiting to see all of you. They're in trouble. The devil's in trouble when all of you comes out of hiding and you just flourish into who God made you to be. And I'm looking around, and I know some of you experienced this already um, just in the time I've known you. And it's awesome, right? More than a black eye for the devil that you are not cowering in the corner anymore, but you are stepping into who God really called you to be because a lot of people have never seen that part of you yet, but they're going to in Jesus' name. Amen? So let's just pray. Lord, I just bless your people. I thank you for their willingness to be here to absorb this information and to have their heart and their spirit, man, open to what you want to do for us. Help us to break the power of that lie and those vows that we made or to tear down that fortress and take off the armor that we think is actually helping us when it's really not because we want to live the full life that you created us to be. You had a plan for us. Right in our mother's womb, you knew who we were supposed to be in you. The devil has tried to derail that identity, but we say no to his plan, and we say yes to your plan, that we will be all who you created to be, exceedingly abundantly above all that we, in our natural ability, could ask or imagine. But we know the plans that you have for us, plans to prosper. And we receive that prosperity in spirit, soul, and body in every areas of our lives. In Jesus' name, everybody said it.